Professor Krauss here says all we have to do is make a scientifically literate public. Well, when you do, how can they do better than the scientists themselves in their percentages of who is religious and who isn't? That's kind of unrealistic, I think. So there's something else going on that nobody seems to be talking about. That as you become more scientific, yes, the religiosity drops off, but it asymptotes. It asymptotes not at zero. It asymptotes at some other level, so they should be the subject of everybody's investigation, not the public. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm telling you. <laughs> so it's not 85% reject. It's that 15% of the most brilliant minds the, the nation has accepts it. And that's something that we can't just sweep under the rug. Otherwise, we're being disingenuous to, our, to the efforts here. Uh, and I'll have to go, I know I'm standing between you and lunch here, so let me try to go quickly. Uh, if you don't think, I, I mean, I think Newton is one of the most brilliant, like the most brilliant ever to sort of walk the earth. And I'm not alone in feeling this. This is his statue in Trinity Church in Cambridge, and he's through the open doorway there. And so you get close to the statue. He's without his curls here. I was deeply upset by that. I thought he was like really trendy with his long hair. But apparently that was probably just a wig at all times. You look at the base of the statue, um, loosely translated, of the genus of all, of all who have ever been human, there is no greater intellect than this man. And so I'm not alone in this sentiment. And this man wrote those words. So, but let's move on because there's more to talk about here. We don't have to stop at Newton. Let's go to Christian Huygens, all right? Brilliant, brilliant scientist. I mean, he was great at chemistry, biology, physics, math, a Dutch scientist, and he died the year that this work was published, one of my favorite uh, works of science writing, uh, and it's Cosmotheros, which is a, an exploration on the likelihood of there being life on the known planets using the available knowledge of the day. So, for example, they knew that, uh, by the way, Huygens like, was the first to identify Saturn's ring as a ring, uh, if I got that right, uh, Carolyn, is that correct? Oh, no, I thought he was the first to calculate that it would be a ring. He was the then Huygens would be the first to observe it. Okay. We have Madam Saturn here in the room, uh, in case you don't know. Okay. Uh, uh, my colleague, Carolyn Porco, who we'll be hearing from later. Uh, I've just been told. But anyhow, so Huygens, brilliant fellow, and one of the probes on the Cassini spacecraft was called Huygens, a, a, a European probe that descended to the surface of Titan. And so he's, he's, in, he's an important figure in the history of science. So what, is, what, what does he say in his writings? Well, uh, uh, you look at the year, 1696, gravity was well known, laws of motion were well known, Newton was quite influential well before the turn of the century there. And so when he talks about the orbits of the planets, it's done. Talks about the moons of Jupiter, done. Talks about the new ring, rings around Saturn, done. It's all fine. But when he talks about biology and life, something that's not well understood then or today, boom, there goes his references to God. But references to God were nowhere else in those writings. Nowhere else, he says. I suppose nobody would deny but that there's somewhat more of contrivance, somewhat more of miracle in the production and growth of plants and animals than in lifeless heaps of inanimate bodies. For the finger of God and the wisdom of divine providence is in them much more clearly manifested than in the other. He doesn't say that about the orbits. We're done with the orbits, as Mike Shermer had noted. We're done. He's in a place where nobody really know, has the answer. So he invokes, this is intelligent design once again. Pure out, flat, and simple. So, you know this story. I have to tell it because it's just great. All right? So Laplace, uh, Ph.D. Simon de Laplace, uh, at the end of the 18th century, wrote a five-volume tome uh, on celestial mechanics, a brilliant piece of work. It was, it's there, it weighs a lot on the shelf, and it, what it does is it takes Newton's laws of gravity and brings them into, the, into a full expression with the hammer of calculus, okay? He brings all the armament of mathematics to bear on the laws of physics that were put forth by Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton only touched on them. They were not fully developed. And in this work, 
he demonstrates, he, he further develops something that had been percolating in the mathematical community, but he develops, and one might even say perfects, a branch of math we would call perturbation theory, where instead of pulling your hair out saying, well, how do you calculate this pair of forces and this pair and this pair and all the equations go to hell, in perturbation theory, it allows you to systematically and reliably calculate the effect of a small tug in the presence of a series of small tugs in the presence of singular big tugs. And that's kind of what most of the sol- what's going on in most of the solar system. And when you do that, and you do that properly, you can demonstrate, notwithstanding effects of chaos, which have other timescales related to them, you can demonstrate that, in fact, the solar system was stable beyond the predictions of Isaac Newton. So he figures this out, does not invoke God, because he figured it out. And in a story that may be apocryphal, but I see more in support of it than against it, this, is, this time coincides, of course, with the era of Napoleon, Napoleon being French and Laplace being French, no translation necessary. Napoleon, if you visited his library, it's not just sort of books of world history and battles, it's engineering books, it's physics books. This man wanted to know where his cannonballs would land, all right? He was much more than just sort of a lucky general. He was into the physics, the engineering, and the material science of war. And so he immediately summoned up the five-volume production of Laplace, read it through, cover to cover, called in Laplace, and said, Sir, I have the exact quote here. Uh, Hang on. Uh, uh, Napoleon asked him what role God played in the construction and regulation of the heavens. This is kind of like, that's what Newton would ask, right? Laplace replies, sir, I had no need for that hypothesis. And so what concerns me now is, even if you're as brilliant as Newton, you reach a point where you start basking in the majesty of God, and then your discovery stops. It just stops. You're kind of no good anymore for advancing that frontier, waiting for somebody else to come behind you who doesn't have God on the brain, and who says, that's a really cool problem, I want to solve it. They come in and solve it. But look at the time delay. This was a hundred year time delay. And the math that's in perturbation theory is like crumbs for Newton. He could have come up with that. The guy invented calculus just on a dare, practically. When someone asked him, why, why, you know, you know, Ike, how come planets orbit in ellipses and not some other shape? And he couldn't answer that. He goes home for two months, comes back, out comes integral differential calculus because he needed that to answer that, qu- to answer that question. And so, so this, is, this is the kind of mind we were dealing with with Newton. He could have gone there, but he didn't. He didn't. His religiosity stopped him. And so we're left with the, real, the, the realization, of course, that intelligent design, while real in the history of science, while real in the presence of sort of philosophical drivers, is nonetheless a philosophy of ignorance. And so, regardless of what our political agenda is, all you have to say is, science is a philosophy of discovery, intelligent design is a philosophy of ignorance. That's all. I don't need to see, whether, I don't need, if, have you discovered anything lately? If not, get out of the science classroom. But I'm not gonna say, don't teach this, because it's, it's real, it happened. So I don't want people to sweep it under the rug, because if you do, you're neglecting something fundamental that's going on in people's minds when they confront things they don't understand. And it happens to the greatest of the minds as it happens to everyone else, many, if not most other people in the public.